So I want to go back to something we talked about when we were uh, motivating different uses of hashing. Uh, so one thing we noted is that uh, it's useful, a use, a use case of a hash function is for storing passwords. And there was a couple of different advantages uh, to doing it. And one thing that we also noted at that time is there's this approach that you might use where if you're going to store a password using a hash function, what you might do is just hash it a whole bunch of times, like a thousand times. Uh, and that's the, the fingerprint of the password that you actually store. And the idea of doing this, the reason that we're doing this is we want to slow down how long it took to compute the fingerprint from the password. And this sounds like a bad idea in the first place because every time you log in, you give the website what your password is. Now they have to put it through this super slow hash function in order to validate whether the fingerprint that comes at the other end matches what they've stored in their database. So it sounds, it sounds like it's going to sort of self-defeating. Um, but the, the, the insight is that if somebody's going to attack a password, meaning that they got a list of fingerprints from the website, maybe it leaked them, and they're just going to try a bunch of guesses, then if you slow it down, um, it's going to really slow it down for them because they're going to be guessing you know, millions of passwords. And so if you slow down every single guess by a factor of a thousand, that's a huge cost across a million passwords. But you yourself, you're only logging in, you know, maybe once a day, or if you're remembering your password, you know, remembering your session, maybe it's like once a month or something like that. And so, you know, the extra milliseconds that it takes to hash it a thousand times versus hashing it once, you don't even feel. Um, so so this, this was the idea. Um, now, this approach, what we did uh, by slowing down a function is we design what we call, some, sometimes it's called a moderately hard uh, function. Okay, so this is an example. So usually in cryptography, we have functions and um, we, we usually live in one of two worlds. Either something is easy to do, it's efficient to do, or it's infeasible. So infeasible means not impossible, but so hard that you know, you're never going to do it in the lifetime of the universe. Uh, this is uh, an example of a function that's somewhere in the middle. right? A hash function is meant to be you know, super fast. And if you, if you design a faster hash function that has the same security properties as the current hash functions, then that's considered a win. Um, so we want the hash function to be really, really fast. Inverting a hash function, finding, say, a, a pre-image uh, for a given image, that should be infeasible, okay? And this is something that's in the, in the middle, okay? So it's, it's not supposed to be efficient. It's supposed to actually be kind of hard, but it's not be, supposed to be so hard that you'll never be able to do it. It's just, it's going to be hard, but it's going to eat up some resources to do it. And in this case, you're specifically doing it because you want to slow down an adversary who's going to be guessing millions and millions of passwords. So you want to make their job kind of harder. You want to add some friction uh, to that particular attack. Um, there's other examples too. Uh, they all have kind of that same flavor where um, there's a legitimate use where you only do something occasionally. And then there's a malicious use where uh, the adversary is doing what you do occasionally, but they're doing it repeatedly. And if you want to separate those two, uh, if you make things a little bit expensive, if you have to pay uh, in computation every time you do something, um, then what you can do is you can drive uh, the malicious behavior kind of out of the market. Um, so uh, one of the original use cases for these sort of moderately hard uh, uh, puzzles was, was for email. Um, and so the idea is that if you send an email, what you'll do is you might have to like compute the hash of the email or something like that and you might have to compute it you know a thousand times and uh, we'll talk about why that's actually not exactly suitable for this purpose but um, anyways you're going to do some moderately hard function that's that's uh, based on the contents of your email who you're sending it to and that type of thing and uh, this will have a cost and if you're spamming spamming means that you're sending you know millions of emails so you're sending emails to a million addresses um, you know, that's going to become very, very expensive. It's going to become prohibitive, okay? So if you're just sending one email, it's fine. You can, you know, you don't, you barely notice uh, the extra work, but when you're sending a million, then it becomes problematic, okay? Um, so there is this protocol called HashCash, uh, uh, 
which was proposed for this. And um, there was even earlier work uh, by Naor and, and Dwork uh, that, that showed it. So this comes out of academia. So I'll just uh, note their names. Okay, and then there's other things. This is kind of like you can think of as a denial of service attack, uh, kind of on your email. Um, maybe it's not exactly equivalent, but anything that has kind of like that flavor. So um, proof of work is sometimes used in forming network connections uh, to combat denial of service. And when I say it's used, it's actually not used at all. Um, so, so neither of these proposals ever caught on. So no one actually used it. Um, it they're just sort of ideas that tend to circulate uh, in academic papers. And you know, I've seen even recent network protocols uh, that that have uh, this proof of work built in, or these moderately hard functions built in uh, to to combat denial of service. Uh, in the spam email case, I'm not sure why what the story is exactly. There's there's a bunch of explanations, but there's a lot of actual legis legitimate use cases where you would actually want to spam a bunch of people. We wouldn't call it spam, but for example, if you have a mailing list uh, and you you have a million addresses, then you can't have mailing lists anymore, right? So that's sort of the consequence. Uh, if you get rid of bulk email, you're killing off spam, but then you're also killing off legitimate uses of bulk email as well. Uh, so uh, there's a, there's another thing that's closely related to this. Uh, it has a moderately hard function into it, uh, which is uh, sometimes what people will do is they'll um, they'll make what's called a time capsule. So what you'll do is uh, you'll take a box and you'll fill it with a bunch of things that are are kind of relevant to you today, kind of that that are artifacts of of life today and you'll put them in this box and then you'll bury it and the idea is that you'll record the fact that it was buried and then in 50 years or 100 years someone will dig up that box and they'll see all of the stuff that's that's in it um, so it's kind of like taking objects and making them travel through time um, and so that that's great that's cool some people do it and uh, a question is could you do a kind of digital equivalent right so could you uh, take some contents, put it in a digital box, so something like a commitment scheme or an encryption scheme, and have it so that uh, in you know a hundred years someone could could decrypt it, uh, but any time before a hundred years they wouldn't be able to decrypt it. Um, so it turns out that you can use moderately hard functions. You can sort of encrypt things so that if you can break this moderately hard function or you can compute the output of this moderately hard function, then you get the key, the, the decryption key. Uh, and then if you have the decryption key, then you can decrypt what's in the, the digital time capsule. Um, so one example of this was uh, at MIT, they had some event to, to commemorate uh, some anniversary. I, I forget the exact details, but there's a cryptographer, Ron Rivest, who uh, made one of these digital capsules and he used a moderately hard function. The whole primitive is called time released encryption. And he actually has a really nice um, kind of write up of how he parameterized that function so that it would actually take about a, whatever the lifespan was supposed to be. I'll, I'll call it 100 years. I forget exactly what it was supposed to be. But um, but yeah, anyways, uh, so this is related to uh, what we call time release encryption. OK, so anyway, these are some use cases. Let's go back to spam email, OK? And so let's say that. Um, if we want to do, uh, or sorry, if we want to fight spam email, what we're going to do is we're actually going to do exactly what we do with a password. Okay, so you're going to take an email and then you're going to send it to the recipient, uh, and you're going to hash it a thousand times as well. Okay, then the recipient they receive the email, and what they're going to do is they're going to check to see whether this computation was done, and if it wasn't done, then they're going to reject it. Okay, so. You can think of it as kind of like a stamp. It, it costs you something. It's like a digital stamp. It's costly to you. Um, and when you receive the mail, you want to check and make sure the stamp is there. And if it's not there, you're just going to ignore it. Okay. Um, the problem is, in order to check it, what you would have to do is take that email, hash it a thousand times. So whatever work they're doing to produce this moderately hard function applied to this email, this sort of digital stamp, you have to do the same amount of work as the recipient. 
What we'd actually like, it would be really great, is if you had a function that was moderately hard to compute, but once you've computed it, if I want to verify that, that, you're, that you actually computed it, I want to verify that, that you actually did the work, um, that I can verify that very quickly, that, that that can be an efficient operation, okay? Um, and so it turns out that you can do uh, functions like this. I'll, I'll give you an example of one. And when you do this, we call it a proof of work, okay? So the work itself is computing a moderately hard function. And in addition, we're going to set this function up in such a way that it's easy to prove that you did the work. And when the person receives that proof, they can just check it and say, yes, that's right as opposed to uh, having to redo it themselves to make sure that it's right. So just, just to give you uh, an example that isn't exactly equivalent, but will get you kind of thinking the right way. Um, you know, imagine if you had a puzzle, right? So you had a puzzle and there's a thousand pieces and you give it to someone kind of scrambled up, right? Like all the pieces are, are detached. Uh, it's going to take them some time to complete that puzzle. But when they're done that puzzle, They'll, they'll call you over and they'll say, okay, I'm done this puzzle, I put it together. You can look very quickly and see that it, it is done correctly, right? Because there'll be an image there and the image will, will look complete. And if there's any missing picture or any missing piece from that picture, your eye will catch it very, very quickly, okay? So it might take them an hour to do the puzzle, but for you to verify that they actually did the puzzle, uh, it only takes you a second or two of, of looking at the puzzle. So that's sort of what we want. And sometimes we actually call call these proofs or the work that you're doing, the, the computation of a moderately hard function, sometimes we call them puzzles. Uh, so they were called client puzzles and there's a few different uh, names for essentially the same concept. Okay, so uh, anyways, the, the terminology that's more common in the uh, Bitcoin space is, is proof of work. Um, so let's denote uh, what a proof of work is. Um, so what we're going to do is, let's think about the email case. So we have the email, uh, which we'll just denote as message, but it can really be any data. And the email would be the contents of the email, who you're sending it to, and all of those types of things. Uh, you have the moderately hard uh, function itself, so we'll, we'll denote it an actual puzzle, okay? So we have this puzzle, we're running it on this input uh, message. Uh, this is moderately hard. There's usually a parameter that you can tweak uh, and to make it harder or less hard, okay? And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how you set that parameter because that, that can end up being a little tricky. Uh, but let's assume that you want it to take some amount of time. So delta t is often a, a notation for a period of time, an interval of time. Um, and so, for example, delta t might be 10 minutes or it might be an hour, something like that. So this is an interval of time to solve. Okay, so you get M, you start working on it, and then after delta T, uh, you'll have a solution. Okay, and so the idea here is uh, you can imagine a scenario where you have Alice and Bob And sometimes Bob is going to challenge Alice. So it's sort of an interactive protocol where Bob sends the challenge, the message, and then Alice has to do the puzzle on the message that Bob uh, sent. And that's usually done because there's some clock that has to start. And so that's how you do it. Sometimes Alice will just have the message herself and she'll just run it on her own message. So that's called the non-interactive. These differences don't matter so much. But anyways, let's assume that, that Alice has the message herself. Um, and so what Alice will do is she'll sort of send the message and the solution over to Bob. And then what Bob should do is he should have a verify function uh, where he can verify that this is actually a solution to that puzzle on this message. And he should be able to do that very, very quickly. Um, so the verify will re return true or false. And the verify will take the solution to the puzzle and the original puzzle itself. Okay, and maybe it will take delta t as well, so you can see that this is a solution to this puzzle, and it, it was sort of delta t hard. Um, but but anyway, to keep things simple, I'll, I'll leave the delta t out.
Okay, so let's think about what a puzzle might actually look like um, concretely. So I'll show you the one that, that is used in Bitcoin. So this is a concrete puzzle. And uh, I'll actually show you a, a variation first. Uh, and then once we uh, see that variation, then we'll look at um, a different variation. So what we're going to do is um, I'm going to challenge you to, let's go back to commitments and we'll actually think of this in terms of a commitment scheme. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll say, hey, you can commit to this message and let's make it a hiding commitment. So you have some random factor and you're going to commit to this message. And when you do that, this operation is very efficient, right? Commit is just a single hash. Uh, so for example, the commit might be H of R. And when you commit to it, you're going to get some value Y, okay? And we didn't really explicitly talk about it, but you, it's hard to predict what the output of a hash function will be. So if you take the hash of a message M, you really have no idea what Y is going to look like. You know it's going to look essentially random, okay? So your best guess is it's just going to be some random number. Um, and until you actually take the hash of it, you don't, there's no way of really predicting it. Or if you see the hash of like 10 messages, predicting what the hash of the 11th message is based on the previous 10 as opposed to just computing the hash function, uh, it's really hard to establish. So um, you have no control over what Y looks like. Okay, you just hash it and Y comes out a certain way. Okay, and so the challenge that we're going to do is we're going to say, hey, this R value uh, can be any value you want. Okay, message M will be fixed. Okay, so we're going to give you this message M, it's going to be fixed. And we're going to say, you can choose this R value. And what we want is we want some property of Y. We're not going to accept every value of Y. Um, so the, the common way uh, that this is phrased and, and uh, the Bitcoin proof of work is, is slightly different, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but what we might say is, okay, Y is going to come out as a random number. And what we want you to do is, uh, we want you to keep trying different values of R until Y happens to come out with a certain number of leading zeros, for example. So let's say it's like 10 leading zeros. Okay, so this, this I know this kind of sounds weird, um, but basically let's, let's try and visualize what this looks like. Um, so what you're going to do is, you're going to take your message and you're just going to pick some R at random. Okay, so you're going to randomly pick it. And you're going to compute what Y is. And let me draw it this way just so that we get a sense of direction in terms of what we're computing in what order. So I, I have my message, I can't change that, uh, but I have this R. So I'll just start it off at some random value. I'll get some Y value and Y is going to come out and who knows what it looks like, but it'll probably look like one, zero, one, 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 zero, 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 whatever. Okay, some random string. Okay, and what I'm going to look at is, I'm going to look at, um, are these first uh, some set of digits, uh, like 10 digits, uh, are they all zero? Do they just by chance happen to come out uh, to be uh, all zero, okay? And so in this case, they aren't, right? There's a one, zero, one, 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 okay? Uh, so then I reject this case. I say, okay, this, this didn't work. And then what I'll do is I'll try it again with a new R, okay? So I might just increment R. I'll just note that as R plus plus. And then I compute Y again. Then I, now I'm going to get, even though this is exactly the same and maybe there's only one bit difference between R, I'm going to get a completely different output of a hash. That's how hashes behave. So maybe I get something that looks like this. Okay, and then once again, I'm going to look at it and I'm going to say, are they all zero? And so this case, actually we have two leading zeros. Okay, so we're, we're kind of making progress. They're not all zero, but we do, we do have two uh, kind of leading zeros, okay? And then eventually if I do this long enough, and we'll talk about how long that is, but if I do this long enough, um, eventually I will, just by chance, uh, I'm gonna have some output and it will come out with the right number of leading zeros and then it will just look like randomness after.
Okay. Um, and so we'll call this, this is kind of like the winning R value. Okay, so this, we'll call it R, we'll give it a tilde on top to show that it's the winning value. Okay, uh, so this is an R value that when you hash it together with M, it actually happens to produce a Y that has a bunch of leading zeros. Okay, um, and so this will take some amount of time. So it's not impossible, right? We can try a bunch of R's and eventually we will get something that will produce uh, this number of zeros. Um, so this, this will take some moderate amount of time. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about exactly what that amount of time is uh, in a second. Um, but what we're going to do is, uh, first off, let's think about how you would validate it. Okay, so validation. So basically, we can go back to our scenario. So we have Alice, uh, she has a message M, and now she's done this moderately hard thing. So she's going to send, hey, here's an M, and here's an R tilde that will produce this number of leading zeros. She'll send that over to Bob. And the question is, does Bob have to do this himself and see that he gets the same R value? Or is there a shortcut where he can just verify whether this R is actually a solution or not? Okay. And so it's so simple that you might be confused by what I just said because you know exactly what the answer is. But Bob, in order to verify that this is exactly correct, he just has to compute the hash of it. So he just does M and the alleged solution. And then he'll say, okay, that produces some output. And yeah, it actually has a bunch of leading zeros. There's at least 10 of these. Okay. Uh, and then he accepts it. And the really cool thing is that Bob actually has no idea that Alice did a whole bunch of work to produce this value because he doesn't see it. Alice doesn't send all the fake or all the false tries, all the false starts, all the values that didn't actually work out. She just sends the one winning value. But because Bob knows something about the probability of this just happening by chance, he can be reasonably assured that Alice had to do a bunch of work to get this R. Okay, she had to try a whole bunch of values uh, in order to get this R. It is possible that maybe on the very first shot, you just get completely lucky and it comes out with all zeros. Okay, we can't rule that out, but we can say that's highly improbable. Okay, so when Bob looks at this, he has some notion of, of on expectation anyways, how much time this would take uh, to compute. Uh, and uh, maybe it takes a little less, maybe it takes a little bit more. Um, but but it takes roughly some amount of time in order to, to do this, okay? Um, so the final question, I guess, is, is how much time does it take? Okay, so let's uh, just build up our intuition a bit and then we'll, we'll do the actual math. Um, so let's say that L is one. Let's consider the case L is one, okay? And so if you hash something, the probability that that first bit, first off, there's only one of two possibilities. Either the first bit is a zero or it's a one, okay? And because the output of the hash will consider just random, okay, so we're, uh, assumption is, uh, Hash outputs are random, uniformly random. And I'll say something about this assumption. So we think it's true. Um, it's not formally covered by pre-image resistance or collision resistance. So uh, you could have a hash function where the first bit isn't random and it could still be pre-image resistant and still be collision resistant. Um, if, if you wanna know why, just think about taking the output of a hash function like SHA-256, add a one to the front of it uh, and say, this is your new version of SHA-256. Um, so that, that always has a one in front of it. So it's not uniformly random, but you didn't break SHA-256 by putting a one in front of every output of it, right? It's so that that new hash function is still collision resistant, still pre-image resistant if SHA-256 itself is. Um, if you didn't get that whole explanation, it doesn't matter. It's just for people who um, maybe want to think a little bit 
uh, about the theory of it. But anyways, uh, so what does that mean, uniformly random? Well, it basically means that uh, the chances of it having a leading zero is 50%, and the chances of it having a leading one is 50%, okay? So if L is set to one, then on expectation, uh, well, we have a 50% chance every time we do it. So if we do it twice and we have a 50% chance, then uh, we would expect that one of those two times uh, we would get a leading zero. So how much time would it, to, would it take to produce a Y with one leading zero? Uh, it, would, it would, on expectation, it would take two hashes, okay? And then we could uh, expand it to two. And so we have two out, Two, income, two possibilities, so 0, 1, uh, 0, 0, 1, 0, or 1, 1, and then whatever we want after, knee, after. And so this case, only this is the winning case. So this is the winning case, and these ones we reject, and they all have probability 25%. So when L is 1, we get 50%. When L is 2, we get 25%. When L is 3, we'll get 12.5%. And so you can maybe see the pattern. Um, basically, the probability of having L leading zeros is going to be 1 over 2 to the power of L. Okay, so when L is 1, it's a half, which is 50%. When it's 2, it's 4. 1 over 4 is 25%. And then if, if you continue on, uh, you'll see it. And then uh, what we really want to know is how many times, how many hashes do we have to compute? Um, so the number of hashes um, is going to... Uh, um, okay, so, so what we're going to do is we're actually going to set it up as a, an ex, a value on expectation. Okay, so let me actually rewrite this slightly different. Um, so let's say that we want to know how many hashes we have to compute um, so that we can expect a solution. Okay, so expect a solution means uh, we expect one solution. Okay, so uh, one, which is the number of solutions we're looking for. Equals, um, it's going to equal the probability that something's a solution. Okay, the probability that one of our attempts actually produces a solution times the number of attempts that we make. And the number of attempts here is the number of hashes. Okay, so we can solve for n by just flipping this uh, over to the other side. And so what we'll see is that n equals to the L on expectation. Okay, so um, the number of hashes on expectation is just a fancy way of saying on average. Okay, so assuming you don't get lucky, uh, or if you do it a whole bunch of times and you kind of average them out, uh, this is how much work it will take you to do. So if I ask you for 10 leading zeros, you're going to do two to the 10 work. Okay, now this is really nice because before we were talking about how much work is two to the something, right? And we said like two to the 80, you could, you know, it's just kind of out of arm's reach of all the networks in the world running together. Uh, two to the 112 is completely out of reach. We think that that's out of reach, you know, for, for at least 20 years. Uh, NIST thinks that. Um, and so here you could set two to the 10 or two to the 20 or something like that. And you can start to see that if you get that L value right, you could find something that takes about 10 minutes. Like you certainly can't solve it in a second. Um, you know, it might take about 10 minutes. You have this problem of some computers are faster than others, and so you'll you'll never know for sure. Uh, but it gives you some fuzzy notion of this is something that that takes some amount of time to solve. It's not completely trivial. It's not something you're going to do in a couple of clock cycles on your computer. It's something that's going to take some amount of time. The exact amount of time is going to vary uh, from computer to computer, uh, but it's at least something. It's it's a delay uh, that that is meaningful. 
uh, and, and we can tweak L uh, based on it, okay? So Bitcoin is going to use this. It's going to use it for a very specific purpose that we'll, we'll talk about uh, in a bit. Um, and this idea of having to parameterize L um, you know, ends up being a little bit tricky. And so Bitcoin is also going to take care of, of how do we figure out what this L, L value should be, okay? Now, uh, when I say Bitcoin uses this proof of work, they actually use a slight variant of it. So let me show you the variant. Um, and so this whole protocol, by the way, uh, is called Hashcash. Um, so uh, Concrete Puzzle, let's attribute this to Hashcash. So this was a uh, system that was proposed generically, but it was really looking at email. That was the main application. And it was proposed before Bitcoin. So some, some years before Bitcoin, there was a system, there was an actual implementation of it and some plugins that for email clients and things like that, uh, that would compute uh, these puzzles uh, for you. Okay, now Bitcoin's variant is, uh, first off, there, there's a problem with this. Uh, so, so we don't need a variant unless if there's some problem that we need to solve. Uh, so the problem uh, with Hashcash is that um, in order to tweak how hard the puzzle is, what we do is we increase or decrease L. Okay, so we can uh, tweak hardness by making L uh, bigger or smaller. Okay, now imagine, I, I wish I had actually had thought through some concrete numbers, so I, I have no idea if this is actually accurate or not, but let's say that on your particular computer, if I say L equals 20, let's say that this takes uh, three minutes to compute. Okay, I think it probably would have to be a bit bigger than 20 to, to, to take up three minutes. But anyways, let's just, let's assume that this is the case, okay? And let's say that what you're actually looking for is you want a puzzle that takes a minute, okay? So three minutes is too long, all right? So what you'll do is you'll say, okay, no problem, I'll, I'll just decrease it. So if I decrease it by one, okay? Note that this is taking two to the 20. Um, this will take two to the 19 and the difference between 2 to the 20 and 2 to the 19, well, 2 to the 20 is 2 times 2 to the 19, right? Or 2 to the 1 times 2 to the 19, or 2 to the 1 plus 19, which is 20. And so what's happening here, it's, it's sort of, it looks like you're, when you increase it one notch, what you're actually doing is you're increasing it by a power of 2. So every time you increase L, the amount of time it, it takes increases exponentially, meaning it takes double. Or if you decrease L, then it's going to have the amount of time. So if you decrease it, then it's going to take 1.5 minutes. Okay. And uh, if you have it again, um, you know, it's going to take uh, less than a minute. And uh, let's actually, let's change the, the parameter of the puzzle a bit. Let's say you're trying to find something that takes two minutes. Uh, so what you can see is if I set L equal to 19, it takes one and a half minutes. If I set L equal to 20, it takes three minutes. Uh, what I really want is I want something in the between that's going to take two minutes. And there's no way to set L uh, so that it takes two minutes, right? I, I'm either getting three minutes or I'm getting one and a half minutes. I can't get it exactly to two minutes, okay? Um, and so how, how would we do that? Well, what you might think is, well, what if we, what if this was a decimal? Like what if it was 19 and a half, right? Like 19 is too small, 20 is too big. So what if we have 19 and a half? Well, what does 19 and a half mean? That means that you have, you know, 19 and a half leading zeros, right? So that, you know, that's not the right notion. I mean, the number of digits is an integer, right? It's, there's no notion of, of a real number, but it turns out that, that there is kind of, you can kind of think about it as a 19 and a half. We just have to change about how we think about things, okay? So if we think of a number, think of a number that has 20 leading zeros, okay? So 20 leading zeros. I'm not going to draw 20, but I'll just draw a couple. And then it's, you know, it's going to have a bunch of numbers after it, whatever. 
okay? What we can say about this number is numbers that have a lot of leading zeros, what they are is they're actually just small numbers, right? And a number that has 20 leading zeros is going to be smaller than a number that has 19 leading zeros. And it's going to be smaller than a, a number that has 10 leading zeros. In other words, the more leading zeros it has, the smaller the number is itself, okay? So we can think, we can sort of recast this puzzle from finding a certain number of leading zeros to just finding small numbers, okay? So think about all the possible numbers that um, y could be. So this is um, all the possible values of, of y. So for example, on this end, y might be all of zeros, okay? So that's, that's possible. That's the smallest possible number. And if y is 256 bits, it would be 256 zeros, okay? The biggest number that y could be would be all ones, okay, 256 ones. And all your other numbers are in between somewhere, okay? And numbers that have 20 leading zeros, right? They're, what, what's gonna happen is they're, they're actually gonna be numbers that are kinda in this interval, okay? Uh, eventually you're gonna hit a number that has more than 20 leading zeros and then you're gonna be in this side, okay? So these are like all the numbers with 20 leading zeros. And then all the numbers with 19 leading zeros um, is, uh, is going to be uh, a bigger set of numbers. So all the numbers with 20 leading zeros also have 19 leading zeros, plus there's some that have exactly 19 leading zeros without that 20th uh, being a leading zero as well, okay? So this is 19 leading zeros. Okay, and so what you're really thinking about is uh, when you hatch things, think of it as, as kind of like you have the spectrum and it's kind of like throwing a ball at the spectrum. So you have this ball, like you pick some random R input to your hash function and you're just going to throw it and it's going to land somewhere along this line and you have no control, right? So the first time you throw it, it might land here and then you throw it again and it lands here and then you throw it again and it lands here and then you throw it and it happens to land, you know, in this region here, okay? And so eventually if you throw the ball enough times, you will get it in this small region and the smaller that this region is, the harder, the more balls you're gonna to have to throw to get it one that's in this sort of winning region, okay? Um, so that's the idea of the proof of work. Um, and so what we can do is instead of thinking of 20 leading zeros or 19 leading zeros, what we can do is we can just think about um, the proof of work as being, uh, find a hash that's smaller than a particular value, okay? Um, so, so we'll get rid of the leading zeros and instead we'll just think of this as smaller than uh, some target, we call it T. Okay, and so if t, for example, if we consider it smaller than 2 to the 256 minus 10, which is 2 to the 246, uh, then we end up with exactly the same pr problem. So that's uh, exactly equivalent to finding 10 leading zeros. Uh, but the idea is that the t can take on any value itself, okay? So when t equals, for example, 2 to the 246, what we're saying is y needs to be a number between 0 and 2 to the 246, not inclusive of 2 to the 246. Okay, so it has to be a, a number in this interval. And then if we want to make the problem a little bit easier, uh, what we can do is we can expand t, so we can make it 2 to the uh, 247.
Okay, this is a bigger interval. Okay, so there's more numbers in this interval, so it's an easier problem, right? You can, it's easier to find a number in this interval than it is to find one in this interval, because uh, this interval is bigger, uh, it's twice as big, okay? But t doesn't have to be a power of two. Uh, there's, no, there's no restriction on it. Uh, so what t could be is it could be, let's say that this, this is taking, um, you know, this is taking uh, one minute, this is taking whatever, two minutes. We want something that's going to take 90 seconds or a minute and a half. Uh, we can pick a t that's in between this. Okay, so it won't be a nice perfect power of two, but we can pick t, uh, which will be some value that's exactly halfway between these two values. Then we will get out uh, something that's exactly 90 seconds. Okay, so by allowing you to choose any value for t, uh, what we can do is we can really fine grain, uh, we can choose the, the, the hardness of the, of the problem using a really fine grain scale. We don't have to double the hardness of the problem or have the double or have the, the problem. So this is what Bitcoin uses. So it uses this small tweak on Hashcash uh, in order to provide that, um, that finer grained uh, uh, parameterization of, of the hardness of the problem.